Robert Smith and Lawrence Lowell Tollerst. Founders of The Cure and best friends. Their friendship was a bit like this coffee cup. Old, but still good. The two had met in the early 1960s through their families. They'd gone to school together since 1964. It was there Robert and Lowell discovered their common passion for music. They stuck together through thick and thin, through band lineup changes, death in their families, excesses, alienation, and world fame. But then something gradually engulfed their friendship. And then, early 1989, Robert sends a letter to Lowell. It's a pink slip. Tullerst is out of the cure. The two won't speak again for 11 years. How did this happen? Was Tullerst really the only one to blame here? Hello, Top Potters. This is Simon Mas, your friend with a master's degree in music and a story of a descent to hell. In an April 1989 article in New Musical Express, journalist James Brown asked Robert Smith why he sacked Tollerst. Hadn't Smith said that the cure wouldn't be the cure without him? Robert's reply touched upon several reasons. Lol had stopped being a productive force within the band. His role had become that of the safety valve. Whatever tension was on the rise, the other cure picked on him to vent off, but Smith casually mentioned another reason too. Also, he was drinking so much, he was the only one who couldn't moderate to any degree. Smith said that LOL would probably be back by Christmas. I don't know what he's doing now, he's gone all quiet. Well, of course he had. LOL was sulking over what had happened and getting mighty drunk because LOL Tollerst did have a drinking problem. He had for a long time, and in the last couple of years, he had grown completely out of control. The sessions for The Cure's latest album, Disintegration, had been problematic, to say the least. Tollerst would sit in front of a TV for hours on end, drunk, out of his mind, unable to play a single note despite wanting to contribute which led to further drinking, of course. This really wasn't new territory for him. The Cure had been forced to hire Roger O'Donnell to play keyboards in 1988 because Lull was often so drunk that he couldn't really play his parts on stage. Was this drinking problem a side effect of living within a band with a prodigious appetite for alcohol and drug consumption? Rock and roll history is full of exaggerated stories, but I'll tell you one. Just to give you an idea, the Cure's 1987 album Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me was recorded at the Studio Miraval in Provence, France. The studio was in the middle of prime vineyard land, and so its rental came with an unusual benefit. People would pay for studio time and were treated with a generous supply of free Chateau de Miraval wine, all you can drink. Lawrence Tollerst is on record commenting that, I think with us they would have preferred it the other way around. Legend has it that the band cleared up an average of 150 bottles of wine per week. 150! <gasps> I'll just leave you a moment to digest this information while you recover. I'll tell you how Tollerst's problem story with alcohol actually started. Before that though, make sure you hit that like button if you want YouTube to show this video to other people. You can also leave me a comment about what you like or what I have to improve. And why not? Consider subscribing to my channel. When I get to 1000 subscribers, so the promise goes, YouTube will give me pennies for your views. Money I can reinvest in the channel to deliver more and better content. What's not to love? Alcoholism. We were talking about that, actually. In his book Cured, Lol remembers his first drink. 
He was DJing at an older people's house party. He got drunk on three glasses of wine and he blacked out. It happens, you might say. Boys will be boys. But there's one detail that is telling about what would come next. LOL still remembers the sensation he felt when he first drank alcohol down to the smallest details. It was the beginning of a down spiral that would last for 17 years. From the very beginning, I was a blackout drinker. From that day on, if I had the funds, I drank to get drunk, and when I got drunk, I blacked out. It didn't help that young Lawrence had an alcoholic father. Tullers would see his father's strange mood swings, and he didn't like them. He generally tried his best to stay away from him, but evidently it was in the genes. When he came to age, Lol embraced alcohol with a passion second only to his love for music. He would steal pure alcohol from the chemical lab he was working and pour it in his pint of beer. It was like drinking a pint of whiskey. As far as alcohol concentration went, he would get smashed regularly. But it went unnoticed. After all, there was little else to do for a young man born and raised in the nowhere land south of London. And then, Tullers didn't have the money to indulge in his vice. It all changed as the cure started picking up steam. The bigger the band became, the more money for their drinking excesses. But while everyone else still kept sober enough to function within the band, Lowell had often made a complete ass of himself. During the 1986 Beach Party World Tour, and again, while recording Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, other band members, Thompson in particular, had said to Tullers that if he needed a break from the band to get better, they would understand. But Tullers was determined not to leave. He knew that he wasn't in a good place and that his contribution to the band was becoming more and more insubstantial, but he simply couldn't accept that he needed help. Perhaps Lowell simply liked alcohol too much, and then when he became an alcoholic, he was in denial. On the other hand, his bandmates weren't exactly nice to him, to the point that there is a fair amount of fans on the internet maintaining that the other cures bullied Tullers. The theory goes that his heavy drinking and gradual retreat into himself was the result of being the butt of the band's jokes, of being their jester, of being, as Myth himself admitted, the safety valve of the band. In time, more than a member admitted that things had turned nasty. The amount of pressure around them was on the rise with every successful tour. Drugs and alcohol didn't help naturally. And then there was this tendency to sweep personal problems under the carpet rather than facing them heads on. When Toller started to pull less and less of the band's weight on the live stage, The Cure started harassing him. The theory goes that The Cure created a monster with Tollers and then blamed him when the monster got unleashed. Personally, I don't think this is a fair assessment of the matter. Even if The Cure really did screw up with Tullers. See, LOL had served as the band buffoon since 1982 or so. It's unlikely that he had started drinking because of that. And Tullers himself doesn't mention in his memoirs that the band dynamics were a fundamental part in the worsening of his addiction. On the contrary, he clearly states that when Smith finally kicked him out, he was devastated. The Cure were his family ever since his mother had died in 1981. I think Smith had avoided the problem for a long time because he valued his friendship with Tollerst so much. Maybe it was wrong to keep him with a band of drunk hearts, but Smith somehow must have hoped things would have sorted themselves out they didn't. And when the rest of the band told him that it was either them or Tollers, he finally gave in. And it was for the best, rest assured. 
in a group of people with communication problems, with alcohol and drugs going around, the weakest link was bound to break, and the weakest link was tolerst. When he showed up to the listening session for the completion of this integration, completely drunk, disparaging the music the rest of the band had worked so hard to record, only to run into the night, it was the final nail in the coffin. It was better to reduce the tension within the band, kicking Lols out before he could literally drink himself to death, and hope he could sort himself out somehow. And sort himself out, lol did. Because sometimes things are broken beyond repair. Sometimes it's best to just buy a new cup, metaphorical or real. And if you need a real one, perhaps you need one manufactured by the corporate sponsor of today's video, Evil Core. Buy more, spend more, keep the economy growing, increase money circulation to create more Mac jobs. This is the mantra of public discussion about our society today. But we at Evil Core think that this doesn't tell the whole story. Tell me more. Buy Evil Core. Give your life a pretense of meaning buying stuff you have no use for advertised by stock videos featuring people living a life as miserable and meaningless as yours. And yet, they'll pretend to be happy just like you'll be when you buy our products. Buy Evil Core. Evil Core! Don't just give us your money, give us your soul. But then again, perhaps it's best to put these pieces together. That's what LOL did as we will see in the next installment of this story. This was Simon Mas. Keep your eyes open for the second part of this story and for more music-related content on this very channel. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love!